Um, my name is Estrid, and I am a PhD student in the lab of Professor Kate Lambertson at the University of Southern Denmark. And for the past year, I've had the pleasure of being in Dr. Brambilla's lab here at the Miami Project. So today I'll talk about what I've been doing while I've been here. Uh, and I've been working on an in vitro assay development for studying the interaction between microglia and myeloid cells in neurological disorders. So let's see. Okay. Here we go. So in all neurological disorder, neuroinflammation is a key feature, and neuroinflammation is characterized by activation of CNS resident cells, such as astrocytes and microglia. And there's also an influx of systemic immune cells from the blood across the blood-brain barrier into the CNS. And all of these cells, both the uh, infiltrating immune cells and the resident cells, increase the release of cytokines and chemokines, as well as reactive oxygen species, hereby constituting the neuroinflammatory environment. But the timing and the characteristics of neuroinflammation is very different between disorders. So you have some more acute inflammatory diseases, which is often caused by trauma to the CNS. This could, for example, be stroke or traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury. And then you have more chronic inflammatory diseases, which are often neurodegenerative, such as multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. Um, and within each of these diseases, there's of course also different phases where they have some more acute phases and some more chronic phases. So it's not just one type of neuroinflammation fits all. There's also both positive and negative aspects of neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation can both aid with tissue repair, but it can of course also further the damage that is seen in these um, diseases. And one of the main drivers of neuroinflammation is the infiltrating systemic immune cells. And they arise from hematopoietic stem cells that are found in the hematopoietic organs, such as the spleen and the bone marrow. And they can develop into these systemic immune cells and it can be divided into two lineages. So you have the lymphoid lineage, which is for example, uh, the T cells and the B cells. And then you have the myeloid lineage, which is for example, the monocytes and neutrophils. And these systemic immune cells are then released into the blood from where under neuroinflammatory conditions, they can be recruited into the CNS when we have this increase in cytokines and chemokines. But of course, this trafficking doesn't just happen all at once. It comes in, in waves. And one of the first responders is the myeloid cells, especially the neutrophils. So that's why I focus on myeloid cells in my studies. Um, another cell type I mentioned is the microglia, which is also, um, they're also activated in neuroinflammatory conditions, and they're the other focus of my study. And microglia are CNS resident immune cells similar to macrophages, and they have a lot of important function under physiological conditions. They're involved in synaptic prunal, regulating neuronal activity, and surveillance of the tissue, among other things. And under homeostatic conditions, they have this very ramified morphology. Then in CNS disease or injury, they become rapidly activated and change their morphology to be more rounded, as you can see here, and they participate in the pathophysiology of the disease. However, their role in neuroinflammation is kind of two-sided. They can both act beneficial, but also detrimental to the course of the disease. And I'll just, I'm just gonna give you a few examples of what that could be. So one thing they do is they increase their phagocytosis. And this can actually lead to unnecessary cell death if they end up phagocytosing some of the viable cells, some viable neurons. But on the other hand, it's very important because it's involved in the clearance of debris and promoting the tissue repair. Another thing they do is that they increase their release of cytokines and chemokines. And this can further promote the infiltration of systemic immune cells, which might lead to further tissue damage and inflammation, but it's also a very important um, key in coordinating the immune response, which leads to tissue repair. So it's not all just black and white. So what I set out to do was investigating the interaction between these infiltrating myelid cells and the microglia. But of course, when you want to do that, there can be some challenges if you want to study specific cell interactions in vivo, because there is a large network of cells in the CNS. You have your 
astrocytes, the microglia, the oligodendrocytes, the neurons, but also all the infiltrating cells. And all these cells communicate not only via cell to cell contact, but also via signaling molecules. Um, on top of this, there is a big similarity between the infiltrating myelite cells and the microglia because the microglia is a type of myelite cells that is specific to the CNS. And of course, you can do uh, sequencing or transcriptomics to look for specific changes in specific cell types. But if you want to look for a really specific interaction between two cell types, it can be very beneficial to make a simplified system. So that is why the aim for my study was to develop an in vitro assay to study the interaction between peripheral myeloid cells and the CNS resident microglia and neurological disorders. And more specifically, my goal was to investigate the effect of the systemic myeloid cells on microglia in both acute and chronic neuroinflammation. And on top of that, I also wanted to see if there was a difference between the interaction when the cells had direct contact with each other compared to when they only could com communicate indirectly via soluble factors. And as I mentioned, there can be a difference within both acute and chronic diseases, depending on the time point. So I also set out to look at different disease time points. So for the chronic part of my study, um, I have been looking into multiple sclerosis because it is a chronic inflammatory neurodegenerative disorder. And in multiple sclerosis, neuroinflammation leads to demyelination of the axons. So you have the myelin in wrapping the axon of the neurons. And when that is broken down, you get these demyelinating lesions. And these lesions can then result in uh, sensory and motor dysfunction. Sim so these symptoms arise in the patients. Um, and the disease typically has its onset in early adulthood, and it can be um, divided into three main phenotypes. So there is the relapsing remitting phenotype, which constitute 85% of the cases approximately. And in this type, the patients experience um, periods of disease worsening. So a disease attacks follows by, followed by periods of remission. So um, they're uh, interchangeable. And then 60% of the relapsing remitting uh, cases turn into secondary progressive, where you then have a continuous worsening of symptoms and the disease progression. The last 15% are the primary progressive, which have a disease worsening from the onset of disease, so they don't have these periods of remission. And as I mentioned, the demyelination in multiple sclerosis is caused by the neuroinflammation. So um, multiple sclerosis is considered a T-cell driven disease where the T-cells bind antigen presenting cells both within the CNS and in the periphery, and they traffic to the CNS. And there's also an increased recruitment of system other systemic immune cells and activation of the local cells, such as the microglia. And all of this leads to an inflammatory environment where uh, there uh, is uh, oligodendrocyte cell death, and this will lead to demyelination of the neurons, axonal injury, and then um, neuronal loss, which causes these um, irreversible impairments to CNS functions. And the model I've been using to uh, study multiple sclerosis is the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis model. And in this model, we cause a uh, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, and this uh, leads to an immune response to myelin-specific antigens, followed by infiltration of peripheral immune cells into the CNS. And this will cause inflammation, demyelination, axonal loss, and gliosis, which mimics what happens in multiple sclerosis. So down here, you can see kind of a timeline of the model. So on day zero, we give the mice a PTX injection. PTX is pertussis toxin, and it causes breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. On day one, they receive an injection with MARC, um, which primes the immune cells against myelin. And then on day two, they receive a second uh, PTX injection to further the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. So based on uh, previous cohorts in the lab, we find that our mice start developing symptoms on around day 10 to 12. So that's why we start scoring them on day eight to catch the onset of the symptoms. And then we found that we can divide them into these two phases where you have the acute phase from onset of, of symptoms until approximately day 25. 
And this phase is mainly due to infiltration of peripheral immune cells, and it's very T cell mediated. And then after day 25, they go into the more chronic phase, which is then, uh, yeah, as long as you keep the mice, uh, is the chronic phase. And these uh, symptoms are more due to neuronal damage and demyelination. So that leads me to the experimental design of my study. I um, isolated mice nuclear from adult mice and um, kept them in culture for five days. And at day five, I then isolated the myeloid cells from the spleen of these EAE mice at two different time points. So I had my acute time point at 20 days after induction and the chronic time point at 30 days after induction. I plated these myelite cells either directly on top of the microglia or in these cell culture inserts. And what the inserts do is that they only allow soluble factors between the two cell types because uh, the bottom of the insert is made of this porous membrane with very small pores. So the cells cannot have direct contact. They can only communicate with soluble factors. Then I had them in co-culture for 24 hours, after which I isolated the RNA from the microglia for gene expression analysis. And I did high content analysis of the microglia for morphological analysis. So as I mentioned, the EAE mice has uh, locomotor symptoms that are scored daily. So what you can see here is a curve of the score of my mice. They're scored on a scale from zero to six, where zero is a completely healthy mouse and six is death. So a score of, for example, three would be complete hind limb paralysis. So as you can see, the mice start displaying symptoms around day 10 to 12. And then there is a worsening of symptoms until they reach this plateau. And my acute time point, as mentioned, was at 20 day and the chronic at 30 days after induction. On top of that, I also made sure that my mice in the acute group had not had symptoms for more than seven days. And I made sure that the mice in the chronic group had had symptoms for at least 17 days. So we had at least 10 days in between the, the two groups. The next thing I did was to verify my experimental setup. So I um, stained my microglia at day five of culture with IVA1. So you can see the representative images here. And then I quantified the percentage of IVA1 positive cells. And as you can see here, I had close to 100% um, IVA1 positive microglia. So I have a very clean culture, which uh, confirms that the adult cultures are working. And then I also confirmed that I was able to isolate my light cells from the spleen of these EAE mice. So what you can see here is flow plots. This one is CD45 and CD11B. And this one is CD11B and F480. So you can see that all of the cells are in the uppermost quadrant here and they group into different populations. So this told me that I was able to isolate these peripheral myeloid cells and that there were different populations within these. And then I established a method to distinguish between my two cell types, because when I plate the myeloid cells directly on top of the microglia, I want to be able to separate them again so I can look specifically at one or the other. And I found that I could use this CFSE labeling um, to load the myeloid cells because it diffuses into live cells and makes them green fluorescent. And after they had been in co-culture for 24 hours, I'm then able to sort the cells so this is what you can see here. There's a population of CFSE negative cells and a population of CFSE positive cells. So I could, for example, take the CFSE negative cells, which I then knew would be my microglia, and then I could analyze them. For the morphology, you of course take pictures of the culture. So, but then because the high content screening is a quite advanced system, you can instruct the, the system to exclude all the cells that are green. So, so that's how I, I uh, distinguish the direct cultures. So now for the results, um, this is some representative images of my microglia. So just to show you, yeah, the microglia are stained with cell mask, making them red and then dappy. So to your left, you have pictures of the microglial cells that have been exposed to the 20 dpi EAE myeloid cells. And to the right is the chronic, the 30 dBi myeloid cells. On the top is the cells that had direct contact and on the bottom, the ones that had indirect contact. And as you may be able to see from the first image up here, the microglia that has been exposed directly to the acute 
EAE myelite cells appear to be more round than the three other conditions. And what the high content screening then does is that it is able to trace the cytoplasm of these cells and then give me different morphological readouts based on that. So that is what we see here. And just briefly to explain the graphs, I have, uh, this is all the analysis only of the microglia. And the blue is when they were exposed directly to the myelite cells. The red is when they were exposed indirectly. The darker colors is the acute time point and the lighter colors is the chronic time point. So what you can see here is this is a uh, measurement of the roundness of the cells. And you can see that the microglia exposed directly to the acute time point is more round than the chronic time point. This is also reflected when you look at the length to width ratio of these cells and the percentage of elongated cells where they have a lower value in both. So this confirms what we saw in the pictures just before that microglia with direct contact from the acute 20 dBi EAE myelite cells are more round and less elongated. I then did qPCR to look for gene expression changes um, to further investigate what's going on with these microglia. So the graphs are built in the exact same way. Uh, and I'm just going to highlight some of the things that I found. I looked at different genes. I looked at TNF genes because we know that both microglia and myelite cells are big producers of TNF. We looked at some classic microglial genes like CXCR3 or TREM2 and um, some phagocytosis genes, LRP1 and MRTK. And what I found was that CD40 um, was higher, uh, had a higher expression in the microglia exposed directly to the 20 dpi cells compared to the chronic. And CD40 is a receptor that's very important in microglial activation during EAE disease peak. And it has been found that it's necessary for T cell expansion and continued infiltration of leukocytes. And this helps driving the disease forward. And it is known that T cells themselves, they express the ligand for this receptor. So they kind of have this positive feedback loop where they enforce their own expansion. But this indicates that the myelite cells at this acute time point is also able to upregulate this um, except receptor. So that's, that's really interesting. Uh, another thing that I found was differences in the two TNF receptors. TNF signaling is very involved in neuroinflammation. And here it seems to be the opposite way around. So the microglia exposed to the chronic um, time point of the myelite cells have a higher expression than the acute. And lastly, I just want to show you that there is also um, differential uh, regulation in the TREM2 and MRTK, two receptors that have been shown to be involved in phagocytosis. And here we see the difference in the indirect contact. So the um, microglia exposed to myelite cells from the chronic time point indirectly show a higher expression than the acute time point in both of them. So from this, I have some conclusions and of course, the main one is that I can use this in vitro assay I developed to study specific cell interactions, and you can use it both to study the interaction when they have direct contact and when they have indirect contact, the two cell types. And more specifically, I found that naive microglia changed their phenotype and gene expression in response to peripheral EAE myelite cells. And these changes depend on the phase of the disease, so whether the disease is in the acute phase or the chronic phase. And they also, it also depends on whether the cells have direct contact to each other or only can communicate with the soluble factors. Of course, there is, um, there's many possibilities of what you can do with this assay and many more things to study. Um, of course, it would be very interesting to examine if the changes I see in gene expression is followed by changes in protein expression. It would also be really interesting to do some sort of transcriptomics or sequencing of the microglia to really look for more specific changes and what is elucidated, what's going on. And of course, uh, it would also be a good idea to investigate the effect of systemic myelite cells on activated microglia because we know that in neurological disorders, the microglia will be activated. So that is another study that would be interesting to do. But what I am going to focus on for now uh, is when I go back to Denmark, I'm going to use this assay to study the effect of peripheral myelite cells from mice subjected to experimental stroke. Uh, 
uh, on microglia to try to identify some similarities and differences between the effect of these peripheral myeloid cells from a more chronic disease, which is multiple sclerosis, compared to a more acute disease, which is a stroke. So just to talk a little about stroke, um, as mentioned, neuroinflammation occur acutely after ischemic stroke, and stroke is one of the most common causes of death worldwide. It leaves 80% of its survivors with permanent disabilities, and 85% of stroke cases are ischemic. An ischemic stroke is caused by an obstruction of a blood vessel, which leads to a limited supply of glucose and oxygen to the affected area, and this will lead to a neuroinflammatory response. And of course, the neuroinflammatory response is important when it helps with the uh, repair processes after injury, but it can also be detrimental and further the damage. And this neuroinflammatory response is really characterized by a lot of different things. So this is just some examples of what happens. You have exotoxicity, increased calcium influx, and increased oxidative, oxidative stress, which can cause neuronal cell death, and these dying neurons increase the release of damage-associated molecular patterns. This will, in turn, activate the microglia and astrocytes, which increase their release of cytokines and chemokines. At the same time, the endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier are activated, and the blood-brain barrier is disrupt disrupted. There is an increased expression of adhesion molecules, and all of this leads to the migration of the peripheral immune cells over the blood-brain barrier into the CNS. And the model I'm going to be using to study the experimental stroke is the permanent middle cerebral artery occlusion model. And in this model, you take um, bipolar forceps, which administer an electric current, and you coagulate the middle cerebral artery. This will lead to an infarct development and neuroinflammation in the affected area. And what I'm going to do is the same thing as I showed you for the EAE mice. I'll have the adult microglia culture for five days before plating the myeloid cells directly or indirectly on top. But in stroke, the acute phase is already one day after stroke and the chronic is 14 days after uh, stroke. And in this case, I will isolate the myeloid cells from the bone marrow of these mice. And I will also use both naive microglia and activated microglia for these studies. But of course, we all know that infiltrating myeloid cells is not the only thing that can affect um, microglia in neuroinflammation. So for the second part of my talk today, I will explain how I also use this in vitro assay to study the effect of soluble factors from oligoprogenitor cells on naive microglia. And this is because we know that oligoprogenitor cells can act inflammatory in neurological disease. So of course, the OPCs are very important in remyelination after injury because the oligodendrocyte precursor cells can differentiate into my myelinating oligodendrocytes, which is involved in this remyelination. But it has also been shown that the OPCs participate in the neuroinflammatory environment because they can perform antigen presentation and they can release cytokines and chemokines. And in Dr. Brambilla's lab, they have worked a lot with OPCs and especially in regards to TNF signaling. And they have found that the absence of TNF receptor 2 in these OPCs makes them more inflammatory. So just to briefly uh, explain something about TNF receptor 2, it has been proven to have a protective role in neuroinflammation and it binds TNF. So TNF is produced by both neurons, glial cells, and infiltrating immune cells. And it has many important functions in physiological conditions where it's involved in plasticity and many other things. But in neuroinflammatory conditions, the release of TNF is increased a lot where it can then bind its two receptors, TNF receptor 1, which is more pro-inflammatory, and then TNF receptor 2, which is thought to promote cellular survival and act more anti-inflammatory. And TNF receptor 2 mainly binds the transmembrane form of TNF. And more specifically, what has been found in the lab is that t when you ablate TNF receptor 2 in OPCs, it exacerbates the inflammatory response. So in this study by Madsen et al. from uh, 2020, they found that if you have mice with conditional ablation of TNF receptor 2 in the oligodendrocyte lineage, you have exacerbated EAE. So that's what you can see over here. You have, it's the same graph as what I showed you uh, earlier. You have the days post immunization down here, the scores, and then the 
knockout mice is in black and the litter mate controls will be in white. And you can see that the black curve starts earlier and is more um, pronounced than the, um, the controls. So they have a worse disease progression. And they found that this was um, followed by an increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier, increased infiltration of systemic immune cells, and also increased activation of microglia. In another study from the lab by Dizu et al., they, uh, she also looked at OPCs in vitro. And she found that under inflammatory conditions, OPCs in general become more inflammatory. So they, um, at the same time, they also uh, have dysregulation in their uh, proliferation and dif uh, differentiation. So they kind of shift their phenotype to be more inflammatory instead of, of this uh, prolifer proliferatory uh, phenotype. And when she compared the um, OPCs with TNFR2 knockout to the wild type OPCs, she saw that this was exacerbated when you had knockout of TNFR2. And some other data from the lab also showed that this doesn't only affect the OPCs, it can actually also affect other cell types. So knockout of TNFR2 in the OPCs also leads to gene expression changes in microglia in vivo. So on these graphs, you see um, results from sorted OPCs and microglia from 12 uh, DPI EAE mice. And it's compared between the mice that had TNF receptor 2 knockout in the OPCs to the wild types. And what you can see is that there's gene expression changes in the OPCs where they have down regulation of TNF receptor 2, up regulation of TNF receptor 1 and CCL2. But when you look at the microglia, they also have changes. There is a downregulation of TREM2 and an upregulation of nitric oxide synthase. So both cell types change the gene expression, even though you only knock out TNF receptor 2 in the OPCs, and they both appear to become more inflammatory. So this tells us that if you knock out TNF receptor 2 on OPCs, it affects the behavior of other cells in vivo. And this might be due to the fact that um, OPCs release a lot of cytokines and chemokines. So here, there was a study where uh, it, where um, a previous student in the lab cultured OPCs for three days, followed by stimulation with a cytokine mix. And after the three hours with cytokines, the media was changed back to just normal OPC medium. And after an overnight incubation, she collected the media and did a cytokine array to look for um, the expression of cytokines and chemokines. And as you can see, they express a lot of different uh, cytokines and chemokines. But the interesting thing is that some of them were increased more in the TNF receptor 2 knockout OPCs compared to the wild type OPCs. So that is, for example, CD40, CD160, and some of the others down here. So because of all this, I set out to investigate the effect of the soluble factors from the OPCs on naive microglia and the importance of TNF receptor 2. So for the experimental design, um, I again isolated microglia from adult mice and cultured them for five days. And then I added the OPC conditioned medium. The OPC conditioned medium was collected the same way as I just showed you with the three days plus three hour cytokine stimulation and then overnight incubation with normal media. And it was then collected. So I ended up with four groups of um, conditioned medium. So from the wild type OPC, C's either stimulated or non-stimulated and from the TNFR2 knockout OPCs, either stimulated or not. I, after adding the media to the microglia, I uh, let them sit for three hours before doing a QP0 for gene expression and for six hours before I did high constant screening for both morphology and phagocytosis. So to begin, I'll just show you uh, some representative pictures from the phagocytosis assay. Um, the, it is again, pictures of microglia in red stained with cell mask and DAPI. And then in green, you have these fluorospheres that the microglia then phagocytose. And what you can see is, when the naive microglia had media from the wild type stimulated OPCs, there is a lot of phagocytosis going on. But if the naive microglia was exposed to the um, media from the knockout OPCs, again stimulated, um, they appear different and have less phagocytosis. Um, so again, I analyzed these pictures with the high content screening and got the output, which shows 
what we saw in the picture that you can see down here, you have the four different media. So this is the microglia with the four different types of media. And when exposed to the media from the knockout OPCs that had been stimulated with cytokines, there is less phagocytosis. On top of that, the microglia from the same group also appear to be less round and more elongated. So this is the roundness. You can see that it's decreased. And this is the percentage of elongated cells, which is increased. So there is also some changes in area, perimeter, and the length to width ratio. Uh, but it really shows that, that the type of media, these um, microglia is uh, exposed to have different responses. And again, I did qPCR for different genes uh, to see what's going on. And what I saw was a difference in TNF. So as you can see from this graph, when the microglia had been exposed to the media from just the plain wild type OVCs not stimulated, they had a higher um, expression of TNF compared to when they were exposed to the media from the wild type that had been stimulated. However, when you look at the two knockout groups, this effect is not seen. So removing uh, TNF receptor 2 in the OPCs uh, changed this effect seen in the wild type. I also found a difference in TNF receptor 1, where uh, there was a higher expression in the microglia that had been exposed to the simulated knockout OPC medium compared to the stimulated wild type OPCs. So it does appear as if knockout of TNF receptor 2 in the OPCs uh, affect how the expression of TNF receptor 1 in the microglia. And lastly, I found a difference in CXCR3, where the wild type OPC medium from the stimulated OPCs um, induced a bigger expression of CXCR3 in the microglia compared to the non-stimulated. And again, this was not seen in the knockout OPCs. So the conclusions from this part of the study was that soluble factors released from OPCs are able to modulate the function of naive microglia. And that the changes in naive microglia in response to the soluble factors from OPCs depend on the state of these OPCs. So whether or not they have TNF receptor 2, but also whether or not they're stimulated with cytokines. Of course, it would be super interesting, again, to do some sequencing to find more differences. Um, so that could be a part of the, the future studies. But with that, I would just uh, like to thank the entire Brambilla lab for having me for this uh, past year. And of course, also my main supervisor, Kate. And uh, I've had a lot of help with all these study, bo studies, both from the flow cytometry core from Oliver and from the high constant screening core from both Hassan and Jan, but also from uh, the Lee lab. Christine has been very um, helpful with supplying me with different things for my experiments. So, and of course, um, thank you for listening and I'll take any questions you might have. Hi, this is Vance upstairs. <laughs> very nice talk, uh, very clear presentation. I'm interested in your phenotypic screening assay. And I was looking at, I think, slide 33. This one or the one with the images? Well, the, uh, the images are, uh, I, let's look at the images for a second. This one? Yeah. Yeah. So to me, it looks like there's a really dramatic difference in the number of little gold particles on the left compared to the right inside the cells. There's a couple of cells on the on the right that have lots, but it, it, it looks like a really big difference. Now, if we go to the next slide, and the phagocytosis is the top. Yeah, this one. Right. Yeah. And so my first question is kind of a technical one. There's a lot of dots there, which is good, but I don't know what the dots mean. Are those independent experiments or those are different wells? What are the dots? So this is a uh, different wells and it's the average of a number of beats per cell. 
So uh, yeah, the average of this one would be around six beads per cell. Uh, and yes, it is individual wells, but it's also um, two different individual experiments. So it's compiled from, from two experiments, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, I see your point that on the pictures, it looks more like a, a bigger difference than what is displayed here. And my explanation for that would be that, that it is an average. So even though some cells do have a lot of beads. There's also some without any beads. So if you average it out, the, the difference become more washed out. And, and uh, that's what we see here. So have, have you talked to a statistician about the way you're pooling data that way and whether those dots represent really independent samples or not? Mm, no, I have not. And of course there are, um, different opinions, because you could argue that it's more technical replicates. Um, my argument is that the microglia have been individually in their well in culture for five days before this media was added. Um, and that's why I've plotted them as one data point per well. But of course, um, doing the experiment multiple times will, will add power to, to the findings. Yeah, I, I would encourage you to talk to Hassan about that, although he would say he's not a statistician. And if okay. you if you talk to Dr. Bixby about it, he he would say that clearly wells in one plate are not independent. Okay. Well, yeah, that is a good input and, and we should definitely discuss that more before moving forward with publishing this data. Uh, other uh, I, I but it seems very cool. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, this is Dalton also on, on, uh, I'm on the second floor. Uh, great, great presentation. Thank you very much. Even that data, does that tell you that there's, even in your cell culture preparations, there's heterogeneity in your, um, your cell populations in terms of response to these soluble factors? Could that be something to be looked at with single cell sequencing or something of that nature? Yes, it could be interesting to look at, at how different it is between both between individual cultures and also between wells, because I do see visually big differences both between individual plates, but also just from well to well. Um, these, these adult microglia do have a very, um, they can act in very different ways, um, which has also given some, some complication with these, uh, with these studies because um, you have to take that into consideration, of course. So it would be interesting to do some sequencing to see if, if that's reflected in also their gene expression. And that's a good point. And I, I do like the, the overall hypothesis that you've got this interaction between circulating inflammatory cells and the endogenous microglia. So which, which brings me to the question, can you integrate uh, something into your experimentation in terms of what's happening at the level of the blood-brain barrier? You mentioned blood-brain barrier several times. So what's happening to the endothelial cells in terms of response to these uh, manipulations that are allowing, for example, these um, circulating cells to enter the, uh, the brain or spinal cord? Um, yeah, I guess uh, I think maybe looking at the blood brain barrier in vitro is challenging because you have to make an artificial blood brain barrier. So maybe after finding some interesting targets in these co culture studies, it would be possible to take it in vivo and then also do some, um, yeah, maybe do some specific knockout studies and also at the same time look at the blood brain barrier. What is what is uh, the effect there if you? find some interesting targets to knock out or overexpress or something like that. Um, because definitely it, it, there will like, obviously it, it, the blood brain barrier is there uh, between the peripheral my, myelid cells and the microglia. So, so it's an important thing to take into consideration if you were to move this um, further into in vivo studies. Yeah, and both stroke as well as uh, MS, the uh, permeability is, is affected. So it's something that has to be integrated. And the last point, I, we do a lot of uh, uh, ischemic stroke and majority of um, patients have, um, it's not permanent, it's actually uh, transient ischemia. Mm -hmm. If you want to integrate the, um, the extravasation of, of circulating macrophages and the effect on microglia in your stroke studies, actually it would be better to do a, a reperfusion model because that allows uh, these, these cells to enter where they may not uh, with a permanent MCA because you don't have any blood supply and that really is severely ischemic area. So just a thought as I've just heard this for the first time, but again, congratulations. Uh, 
Glad you had a great time in Miami and thank you for uh, thank you. a great research talk. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, couple of questions actually. Uh, one, the first one is relating to the OPCs. Yeah. So if you knock out TNFR2 in OPCs, mm -hmm. you would predict that would make it more inflammatory, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you take that media and you put it on the microglia, yeah. that reduced phagocytosis and made them more amplified, right? I would suspect so, yeah. But wouldn't, but doesn't that mean that it's actually less inflammatory? Because if it's more inflammatory, there should be more phagocytosis and the microglia should be more rounded, right? Yes. Yeah, so, um, but I, I think it also depends on, um, of course, these these microglia have only had the soluble factors. So it might also have something to do with, with uh, whether or not they have um, direct cell contact, but it it's true, but it could also maybe be because they're not uh, immediately, this is very like a short stimulation with the OPC medium. So maybe the initial response is not the phagocytosis, but some, they kind of choose to do other functions, you know, where you see this upregulation of CD40. So maybe their initial response is more of regulating the, the um, trafficking and all this and not so much phagocytosis. Maybe phagocytosis would be at a later time point. I don't know. But but yes, it is interesting that that we see this decrease because they do seem like morphologically to be um, less in inflammatory. So I would need I need to think more about it um, and, and kind of make sense of it still, but but it is definitely uh, interesting. So, so I'm, I'm understanding that correctly. It is opposite of what you can, it's interesting. Especially, but it's I mean, right? I don't know so much. Of, um, I mean, yeah, the phagocytosis and the morphology is opposite of what I expected. Okay. Yeah. The other one's a technical question. When, when you did your co-culture of microglia and macrophages with the direct um, contact, mm -hmm. So they were in the same like, same well, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then you did uh, uh, PCRs to look at certain cytokines and chemokines. Mm -hmm. So so does is that from both cell types or is that just from microglia? It's just from microglia because I did um, the CFSE loading of uh -huh. the uh, myelite cells and then I sorted oh, out the CFSE out the well. and only analyzed this this population. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Wait, did you happen to look at microglial mark, like the classic microglial markers, like uh, 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 sex 3 cr one and P2RY12 to see if those are changed at all? Um, I didn't do all of them. No. Um, so I did have some classical, but not the ones you mentioned. Um, I had some issues with some of our primers and then like, so it was more of a, I had to pick and choose because I also had a limited amount of, of cDNA to, to look at. And that's why I think it would be interesting to maybe do some sequencing so you can find really the full story of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Did you have an input, Roberta? Yeah. <laughs> No, I just wanted to make a comment about the phagocytosis because obviously it was a sort of an unexpected result, but one could think about it as phagocytosis being a homeostatic function of microglia that is very important for normal activity of microglia. So it doesn't necessarily mean that more phagocytosis uh, or is, is bad, or it just, it could be actually a protective um, response. Uh, and, debris clearing response. So the fact that we have less could be an indication that this microglia is, is impaired somehow in their normal function. So that's the way I kind of see it. Um, but yeah, that's cool. open to interpretation. Yeah. Hi, so is there any potential to use this assay to study the interaction between pericytes and microglia or the OPCs? Is that something that you would maybe do or think about? Yeah, it can be applied to um, all cells you are able to maintain in a cell culture. Um, so it definitely you could you could um, use other cell types, and you could also flip it and have the um, myeloid cells, and then exposed to the microglia. And yeah, so it is it is an assay that can be applied to many different studies. Uh, so this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. 